There are these cliches in history we heard so often that we don't question them anymore. They became part of pop knowledge. We use them in metaphors, comparisons, descriptions, and so on. The thing is, we do some historical figures wrong. We reduce them to a certain characteristic that either just shows a small aspect of that figure or is even wrong. Yes, you heard that right. Because the descriptions we have of them date hundreds or even thousands of years back. Who were the ones writing the knowledge down back then, I ask you, preserving the knowledge for future generations? Yes, mostly white men or even white Christian men. And even if we can be grateful that they wrote down these things, because without it we wouldn't have anything, we need to read their text carefully. Because, of course, as today they were not free of prejudices, they were probably even worse. We will see this, for example, by talking about Attila the Hun. He was described as the ugliest, cruel monster ever to be seen. He was a conqueror, and the people here were afraid of being invaded by his troops, so of course they wrote bad about him. If he would have been European, the people here would have loved him. So you see where I'm going here. So let's start with our first misunderstood figure of history. And as I already started talking about him, I present you Attila the Hun. Attila, the king of the Huns, is the prime example of the pillaging and murdering horsemen from the east. To this day, he is regarded as an arch-villain and is associated with robbery, murder and plunder. In Germany, for example, it has long been said that he had 10,000 of virgins killed during the siege of Cologne. In fact, Attila the Hun is nothing more than a projection screen onto which all the hatred that the peoples of Europe felt for the horse-riding peoples back in the early Middle Ages is cast. Not even the word Hun is really defined, it simply referred to all peoples who were unknown and frightening at the time. This image of evil has lasted an incredibly long time. And the image of the murdering army of mounted warriors is still associated with Attila today. But were these horsemen really so evil? As I said before, the question of good or evil as always corresponds to perspective. His supporters describe him as just and organized, who pedantically made sure that the tribute collected was divided fairly among his followers. Among the Romans, he was considered greedy because he demanded a lot of tribute, but everything he demanded, he distributed back among the people. So he was not a greedy, wasteful ruler sitting in his palace far from suffering among the people. In fact, many people from the Roman Empire also voluntarily fled to the Huns because life was better and fairer here. In fact, however, he was no saint. He even ruled marginally with terror, waged countless wars, wiped out cities and brutally subjugated his enemies. But should this be called evil? In such a martial epoch, in which war was everyday life and Attila was first and foremost a conqueror and not a statist, I would answer in the negative. He was a benefactor for his followers and a villain for his enemies, as was and is the case with many politicians. Speaking of politicians, who also mainly did politics but is remembered for something completely different, is Cleopatra. The ancient beauty, the seductress of Rome, the diva who bathed in donkey's milk and had herself rolled up in a carpet and carried into Caesar's palace, choosing suicide by having her breast bitten by two cobras. Most of this is myth. Cleopatra VII was first and foremost a gifted speaker and diplomat who came to power with skill and stayed in power longer than should have been possible. She came from the royal dynasty of the Ptolemies and studied medicine, philosophy and the art of discourse. She knew Latin, Ethiopian, Aramaic and Arabic. When Cleopatra was in her early 20s, she met Gaius Julius Caesar who was already 30 years older at the time. The liaison between the two was in retrospect romanticized. But it was much more about politics. Caesar just saw her as a much more suitable ruler of Egypt than her brother, and Cleopatra needed a powerful ally to help her rise to power. But as you know, Caesar was not to rule for long. After assassination in the Senate, the question of power in Rome was open, and there was a duel between the West and the East, Octavian and Antony. The latter is said to have succumbed to Cleopatra's charms to such an extent that he completely forgot about the campaign and all politics. Cleopatra is portrayed here by the writers of Rome and the Middle Ages as the oriental seductress, who, with her charms, seduces the actually righteous Roman to lust a life of luxury and idleness. Here, one must again bear in mind that history was written by the victors. So the narrative was Octavian wins, Antony loses. And the reason was said to be his disastrous liaison with the seductive foreigner. At first, this had something educational about it, in the sense of don't get involved with the pagans. Later, this shifted to the frivolous, and here the story with the breasts and the cobras comes into play again. In painting, Cleopatra was depicted more and more naked over the centuries and her suicide is first depicted as snakes being placed on her arm. Then later the snakes are placed on her breast, 
and the snakes then become smaller and smaller and the breast larger and larger. Women in history like to be blamed. They are witches, whores, imposters, and a bad reputation is hard to get rid of. Sometimes it even lasts for centuries. This was the case with the most famous evil queen in history, Catherine de' Medici. On Bartholomew's night on the 24th of August 1572, soldiers marched through the streets of Paris, shouting, kill them all. For almost a week, they slaughtered their way throughout France, slaughtering around 10,000 of Huguenots. When we think of this massacre, we think of the black widow Catherine de' Medici, the bloodthirsty Catholic fanatic who pulled the strings as the intriguing and power-hungry widow of the French king and mother of the next three kings, a kind of demoness of history who has gone down in the collective memory as a string-pulling murderess. Catherine is the welcome villain in the story, as an Italian, the motive of the evil foreigner, and then also from an improper family. This suits the French well. They are not to blame. It was the Italian. We French would never do such a thing. The story around the night of Saint Bartholomew is complex, and the people like to have a simple solution. A villain onto whom they can project all their hatred. The religious wars between Catholics and Huguenots that happened beforehand played into the context. The scheming dukes who hated all Huguenots and used every reason to get rid of them too. In fact, Catherine herself married her daughter to a protestant, but it was after this blood marriage that the massacre was to take its course. She herself gave the Huguenots a certain degree of religious freedom and advocated a peaceful solution to the conflict. But the hatred for the Huguenots and the Catholics' fear of a protestant conspiracy was already too great. Although Catherine certainly played an influential role, History tends to overlook the role of the king himself and that of the dukes. These were the ones who called for murder in the first place, not the queen. Another scapegoat in history was probably the so-called demon at the Tsar's court, Grigory Rasputin. There is a hundred times more speculation than fact about him. For his admirers, he was a prophet, a miracle worker and a messenger of God. He fascinated and polarized. Others saw him as some kind of devil and blamed all sins on him, saying he was an anarchist, a sex maniac, a molester of girls and a spy. This image of the sex guru with hypnotic powers has stuck in history. Boney M sang about him, lover of the Russian queen and Russia's greatest love machine, the great song by the way. The circumstances of his death probably also contributed to this myth-making. It is often said that his opponents tried to murder him with huge amounts of poison, that they tried to shoot him several times and that he just wouldn't die. In the end, they threw him bound and wounded in the Neva, where he finally drowned. When the people of St. Petersburg found his body in the river, they came by the hundreds to scoop the water he was floating in out of the river because they wanted some of his magical powers. For the Tsar's family, he was indeed quite indispensable. The Tsarina, who lived in constant fear of the death of her sick son, saw in Rasputin the miracle healing monk from a peasant family in Siberia, her only hope. He was irreplaceable and charismatic, and built a reputation as a seducer of women by simply listening to the married ladies and probably giving them attention they did not get from their husbands, if you know what I mean. Because his history is so closely intervened with that of the last Tsarist family, he was often blamed for the downfall of the Romanovs. In fact, Rasputin warned Nikolai II not to get involved in the First World War. And as you can imagine, he did not work as a spy for the Bolsheviks. He was simply like an alien, the plebeian in royal circles, who usually stayed far away from the common people. Speaking of rulers who give no thought to the concerns of the people, here follows our final candidate for today, Emperor Nero, who went down in history as a firecracking sadist with an Oedipus complex. Nero, the monster craving Christian blood, the mad emperor, the incarnation of evil and dead in such a powerful position. In fact, objectively speaking, Nero was simply a mediocre emperor. So where does this obsession to see him as the villain of history come from? Is there really any truth in the prejudice? Yes, he did have the blood of his own mother on his hands. But in fact, there were even much worse emperors. Tiberius, for example, was a pedophile. Back then, that was a minor sin. But he had people eaten by moray eels and created a spying state. Then there was Domitian, Commodus and Caracalla, all three of whom surpassed Nero in their lustful bestiality. Marcus Aurelio Antoninus organized sadomaso orgies in which the participants suffocated in the dense rain of roses. But it is Nero who is associated with all what was bad in Rome. Probably the most consistent character assassination of all time was carried out on him. The reason he contradicted the ideals of Roman masculinity and the ancient historians took revenge for 
about this afterwards. He probably had his mother murdered because she wanted to destabilize his power. He had the Christians persecuted because they were considered enemies of the state, quasi terrorists at the time. They may even have started the fire in Rome, not Nero. He even led the rescue efforts to save the city from the flames. In the end, we can say that Nero was not a particularly good emperor, but he was neither mad nor evil in person. But this clarification comes almost 2000 years too late. In the case of Attila, Cleopatra, Catherine de' Medici, Rasputin, as well as Nero, any redemption is in vain. The reputation is ruined forever. And yet it is important to realize that history is always written by the victors. And they determine the narrative, what is remembered and how it is remembered. And that's why it's important to regularly question what is believed to be true. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in great historical figures that are forgotten, please click here.